Hello, hello, hello. And here we are for another episode of Flower Hour. Today I have on a guest, Jamal Walker. I went to school with Jamal down um, Ernest Bevan. What an interesting experience. So <laughs> it's been great. We've been able to connect. Um, Jamal also has a podcast um, alongside two other creatives called As It Unfolds. But today, Jamal and I will be just having discourse and having a conversation about everything that's happening in the world right now off camera. Jamal and I were talking about um, solutions in the world and how there's so much things going on, but are there any solutions? Are solutions even tangible? Are solutions even possible? So that's what Jamal and I will be talking about alongside many other things. Um, Jamal spoke about he is omnivorous when it comes to so many issues that I think is an absolute great adjective. So we're going to eat up discussion, see how much we can have to offer towards discourse that is happening right now in the world. So... Let's get into it. Jamal, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, man. What's going on, Sean? Thank you for having me. I'm well. Yeah. I'm well. Yes, man. I'm absolutely um, thankful I'm able to connect with someone from school and have the conversation that we have because um, you and I were speaking before about what happened to most people from school. And a lot of people from school we still know are out and about, but unfortunately, some people have ended up in other places in the world. So the fact we're even able to have this conversation, I suppose, is a blessing within itself. 100% man and like, like you said how rare is it to reconnect with someone that you haven't seen in five ten years someone that you've grown up with partially in school but again we still live our own lives quite separately and you know through some sort of fate the things we've managed to care about have aligned to bring us to you know this, this point right here so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I love what you're doing with, with, with the show man it's, it's, it's big so hopefully I can add some some contributions to that no absolutely man that's why I wanted to have you on to add towards the discourse that's happening in society and you mentioned that often nowadays we're having a lot of debates and you said debates are very confrontational by nature because there's a presupposition that there is a right and a wrong which I think is relevant in some debates and then some debates become more about life experience and how we see the world so how do you feel about the world right now like what goes through your mind when you think about the human existence this is this is the thing right and this is why i think we need to read more um and and be a bit more introspective so for millennia the world's evolved we're just not aware of it and and i know we say we get it because we can, we can watch old movies we can read history books but we've not you know tangibly experienced the world's growth throughout all its time yeah and because we've got that limited view of experiences about the world we get lost in our own one you know, we get completely lost in our own one. As I was saying to you earlier on, off, 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 off record, um, we're, we're all suffering from conformity fatigue. We're all suffering from compassion fatigue. We've got so much fatigue, but I want us to be having zero fatigue because we need to find solutions. We, we, we're doing ourselves a massive injustice if we allow the world to consume us, you know, if we just allow what's going on in society to consume us and to, to get the better of us. But again, it's so easy for me to say that, you know, I think going forward and how to sort of digest what's happening in the world because a lot is happening and a lot's happening that I'm probably still unaware of you, you know there's probably some things that I don't even have the the knowledge and the awareness of which always reminds me that I should be humble and, and present we need to be a bit more present we, we need to find ways to optimize that's for me fundamentally what one of our human natural given desires is is to optimize we're solely here to make better use of what we have. It's about like scarceness. It's about how do you make more less? How do you utilize? How do you get more efficacy and outputs of things you're doing in the world? So I kind of want to discuss that. And I want to, I want to, I don't want it to be like another sort of, uh, you know, the world sucks. This is a deep, dark <laughs> conversation. And to some degree it does suck. And that's, and that's not a bad thing. You know, it's not a bad thing because I think pain is a very intuitive experience. Yeah. Uh, it, it informs and guides decision making and we, we need that as a, as a mechanism for survival and action so let's talk about okay things are tough but how can we come out of it at the other end and move the dial forward that's where I, I'm at I suppose whenever we think about you know when people like the world sucks I hate humans it's quite a nihilistic <laughs> um, way to see the world right and I remember I heard in a motivational speech that some would argue to say the world sucks is quite a realistic viewpoint. And then they also mm. said that realism is a socially acceptable form of pessimism. And that really <laughs> sat with me, right? 
because mm. I think a lot of people in society are hope merchants. I feel like they're selling dreams. They're selling you the idea of something that's not to, that hasn't come to pass. But then in accordance with the Martin Luther King quote, what is it? Faith is believing in the first step when you can't even see the um, staircase. And I think yeah. that is incredibly relevant. Like you sound quite optimistic with the world and you speaking about compassion fatigue, um, fatigue in many other senses it's quite relevant because we live in a society now where we are oversensitized to the point where we don't know how to ex exist without a phone for example you have social media addiction and then you have what happened with George Floyd reshaping the dynamic of the racial atmosphere and I'm sure I'm not sure if you read my article but I wrote about how I felt Black History Month was incredibly underwhelming because there was that racial fatigue. That conversation we have about race was only supposed to be a month in October, but we were having mm. that conversation way, 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 way back. So how have you been able to manage your own fatigue then personally? Do you shut off from the world? That's a great question, man. That's a great first question. Um, first thing I will say is everyone needs to be given the freedom to identify with their emotions in their own way so we can't dictate to anybody how they should do that I don't believe in that I don't believe that there's a one-size-fits-all approach it's not prescriptive it's a framework and, and within that framework you adapt it to suit your needs so I I'm a massive believer that when the world gets too much you've got to remember that you're important too and, and you've got to remember that if you're going to be any use to the world least of all yourself you have to take time to digest things and that can manifest in so many different ways for some people, it is shutting off and, and maybe just journaling. For some people, it's screaming and shouting. For some people, it's talking to their friends. For some people, it is just doing nothing. It's, it's stillness almost. Yeah. Um, and for me, I'd, I'd say it's an amalgamation of everything, depending on the situation I, I fall into. But you made a point earlier on, that I, and you was like, you know, I seem you know, hopeful about humanity. Um, not necessarily, you know. It's just that I'm hopeful about the control I have over my life. Yeah. And all I can do is exert that the best I can on everyone. I, th I think we get into the trap of trying to say the world too much. Yeah. This is something that one of, one of my boys said. I'm, I'm going to shout him out actually because he deserves this. Um, one of my um, co host, um, Mutar Rush, right? He said this once and he was like, In your life, you're always player one. Like, you, you, you're not, you, you are the main person in, in this game. There's no one else really and truly. Of course, we, we, you know, we try to be altruistic and whatnot, but you are player one. So, we get into this habit of trying to save the world and we, we consume the problems on ourselves, and we feel like we're, 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 you know, we're carrying the burden for the world when really we're, we're a speck, you know? And um, yeah. I mean that not even in a bad way, but something that one of my favorite artists said, Frank Ocean, he's, he goes, you know, he goes something like, you don't know how little you matter until you're on your own. And that sounds quite dark, but I think it's, a, it's, it's actually quite beautiful because what's wrong with understanding your fallibility? Like what's wrong with that? What's wrong with understanding your human limitations and, and understanding that, right, let me work on just manifesting the best out of what I can do in this space and be okay with that and understand that it's never going to be complete. So I, I deal with, to answer your question, I deal with the troubles of the world um, through meditation, through reflection, and through honest conversations with myself about my ability to impact those changes. You know, I tried to meditate once and I remember I went to a temple <laughs> in Wimbledon and I fell asleep and my friend had to wake me up because the monks were staring at me quite angry. But um, I need to go back and really have that journey with meditation. I struggle to meditate and perhaps maybe because I struggle with the stillness of my own mind. And mm. I read 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. And I know for some people, Jordan Peterson is incredibly controversial. So what I'm going to say is, I hope you don't find any of the comments that we have inflammatory. So that's a precursor in some senses. And it's also an <laughs> apology to if you are offended, but um, offenses to be taken, it's not given, right? So I'm putting it out there. Um, but Jordan Peterson speaks so gravely about having responsibility in your own life, given your own life purpose and meaning. And one of his analogies is most simply clean your room before you try to go out there and clean the world. And I absolutely agree with that in theory. I think mm. a lot of politics we have nowadays, because you know me, I'm really big into politics. A lot of politics is very, it has like a moral superiority, a moral hierarchy where a lot of people who are liberal swear that they were liberal. I think I'm more illiberal, but they believe that they're trying to save the world, but they haven't got their house in order. And I think, I remember someone said, if your ship is shallowed, it's moored shallowly in the waters, when the storm comes, 
the storm will take your ship. And that sat with me more so than anything else. You know, we, as you said, Mukhtar said, we are our own players. We are the own player in our own game. So what do you do within yourself to impact the people around you? Because you can only start with, the, with your surrounding environment before you move into a bigger field, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, seeing as you've hit me with, with a few quotes, so I'm hit another quote, right? Um, but I love the young lady called Cleo Wade. Uh, she's a writer. She's an American writer. Writes some real poetic stuff. Um, and <laughs> you, you want to know what I do to impact my environment and how to deal with these situations. Similarly to you, something that I, I once learned and I heard her say once was that learn to understand that people that disagree with you aren't always your enemy. Absolutely. And you, when you can operate from that kind of distance in a way it's, it's almost like you're you're present but away in your own experience and that kind of allows you to have a more jeweled nuanced opinion on yourself objectively and people around you and you can take in people's feedback because this is what happens so much we we, we hear things but we hear them and we internalize them based on our already finely ingrained preconceptions about what that means yeah so you might go to me oh hey jamal that's a bit weird now, I'm going to internalize your comment as something that I previously heard that, 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 that I don't like. And I'm now trying to understand and, and define what you mean. And, I, and now I'm letting you live in my mind rent free, which is insane, right? Absolutely. So, like I said, understanding that enemies aren't always people that are around you um, and that just disagree with you. And how do I deal with all this stuff? Well, you, you, have to, you have to believe that, again, we're player one in our game. But like I said to you with the Frank Ocean quote, we, we are just one. And that's not a bad thing to admit that you aren't, the center of the world it's, it's okay uh and also something i you know oh what's his name dr phil said this once on a on a, on a podcast with, with joe rogan and he was like you know when, when you stop trying to be everything all the time everywhere for everyone you can appreciate the things you're not good at you know for example i, I can't sing never 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 could <laughs> i've lied about it before but it's, it's not true right so <laughs> <laughs> i've tried i've tried many times but i, I quite like music and, and, and i like singing i'm not good at it but the moment I stopped feeling like I had to become a singer, I got to appreciate actual singers. You can appreciate yeah. people's qualities better when you're not trying to trying to absorb them and make it about yourself. So there are people that are better than you at things, um, and that's fine. Another point before I, I let you ask the next question is that uh, we're all equal, but let's let, you know let's not romanticize the idea that everyone's the same because we're not the same, and, that, and that's perfectly fine. We're different but equal, and I want to clarify this for everyone listening: we're we're equal in human value. Like no life is more than another life, for sure. Our, our lives are equal. The, the human value of a human is not different anyway. We're, 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 we're on par. But as individuals and our skill sets, we're, we're different. And there's no reason why we shouldn't harness the fact that we've got different things that make us strong in some areas and we can add areas. I think you're not the only one who um, likes to pretend he was a singer. I always say that God, <laughs> God, you know, God made me tall. God made me good looking. But the one mm. that didn't make me was a singer. If I could sing, I think the world would be a completely different place. Trey Songs, Chris Brown would have absolutely nothing on me on that stage. So that's a really <laughs> funny conversation in that sense. But you're Please. right. I, I feel like the creative industry now, it's almost created a normality where people feel like they have to be everything. They feel like they want to be everything, you know. And I've probably fallen get to, um, victim to that too. Like I've got a master's, I've got a jur- I'm going to be finishing my journalism degree by the grace of God. Um, but then I'm also doing this podcasting thing. I write articles, you know, I, I talk about politics. Where do I find that time to find that stillness within myself? And it's quite hard for us to have mm. those conversations, you know, within ourselves and especially as men, right? It's not easy for us to always admit it's okay to not be everything. But do you not feel like in the society that we're in as men, do we have that added pressure of having to almost be everything? So once upon a time ago, of course, evolutionarily speaking, we would hunt, right? We would hunt for food. We would hunt for um, vegetation, whatever it might be, right? Not hunt for vegetation. You would find it, whatever, plant it. But now we're hunting in a different way. We hunt money. You know, the, the, the way the world has changed, the dynamics of the world has absolutely changed in ways that we can't comprehend. And as you also said that, I don't think we ever realized that change. And do we ever really sit down in hindsight and realize 
just how much the world has changed. Now, you said you read quite a lot. When was it in that, when, when was the moment where you realized, hold up, this world is, has changed and I never really understood that? Wow. <laughs> that moment, the answer to that question is that moment's happened to me many times. That's the truth. You almost have to re-realize it when new things change. I think I'll never forget, I guess, growing up and, and you go through phases, you, you go through phases of life. I, I remember like a lot of the, the the terrorist bombings when I was younger. I just remember, I just remember like watching the fair growing people. I also remember the prejudice growing in people as well. I also watched the bigotry grow, growing in people's um, behaviors and mannerisms. I, re I recall that shift and I couldn't grasp it at a young age, but I knew something wasn't right. And I, and I knew that people were making decisions based on limited information, but based on fear. Um, and propaganda I also watched I mean like I, said, I, I work in tech so I've just watched technology grow yeah. and I've watched how technology has empowered us but almost almost controlled us as well absolutely it's consumed us yeah, I've, I've watched that as a phase as well and, I, and I've been like wow the world is changing and we're not really um taking it in and, and, and appreciating it um and something that I've always had to do is I always try to find the truth behind the stories I'm told or find the truth behind what things seem and my biggest like buzzword that I use all the time in all my podcasts and all my conversations is information is symmetry is the biggest killer of communication absolutely I don't think there's a bigger one of course there's others but that's where it starts from and, and yeah. by that I mean to clarify is that people are either misinformed yeah they don't want to know the truth yep they like to make up alternative facts and it's yeah. so hard to detangle what that means it's, it's so difficult and that's that's something that i've realized again moving this more to the present time covid19 that that was a change as well that I, I noticed I, no, I noticed at the beginning I, no, I noticed the shift of some factions of the community not really caring some caring and it just created political divides i remember the 2016 brexit we had, we had 2016 right in june i was abroad so it didn't really hit me and I watched it, I was in Prague, some of my friends, and I watched it on the TV. And we was like, oh, wow, okay. So we're, we're leaving the EU. But you don't you don't fathom the gravity or something like that at the time, because it's, it's not immediately affecting you. But I remember the shift in like thinking, like, okay, wow, I'm becoming quite conscious politically. I then recall now, looking at all the different things that have happened, I, I look at the riots, I, I look at um, the protests, and I look at where we are today, with COVID-19, with racism rife as ever, with inequality rife, rife as ever, what's going on in China? And I realize people don't really care, which is quite sad in some ways, enough. But then on the, on the flip side, I believe people care, but they don't know how to act. They don't know, people are so used to seeing pain now that they don't know what the right response is. And nobody wants to be dictated to about how they should make changes. We shouldn't tell people that they must take the knee. We shouldn't tell people that they must have poppies. We're dictating to the society too much about how they should show compassion. And that's why we think we're in a trap. Um, just to conclude, you, you made a point earlier about having to always be something. And you mentioned evolution and, and, and men being hunter gatherers and we're having to always be everything. I've, I've got a theory, right? If you're in, your, however, however old you are, if you believe that you have to be everything, because I've, I've seen it, people, people do look at social media, right? You're, you're doing for me one of three or four things. You're one, just really good at a lot of stuff. Fair play to you. <laughs> Two, you're, you're lost. Or, or three, for me, you're overcompensating for something. Absolutely. And you've you got to figure that out quickly. The, it's, it, it's such a true point, you know, I think a lot of us are lost though because do our lives really give us meaning you know we're not really Ooh. supposed to do nine to fives you know we're hit with dopamine overloads we're desensitized at the same time and as you said there there's pain all over the world but people are being told how to show you know they are morally right or morally disagree with something so you have nowadays a lot of clicktivists where a lot of people feel like if they click on a button they've done their activism for the day or they've done their you know caring for the day and that's quite tiring in many other senses um 
I had some people during the George Floyd, the unfortunate death of George Floyd, they said they had to shut off from social media because all they saw on social media was George Floyd everywhere. And then brands jumped on it with um, the black squares. And then, you know, you had the hashtags Black Lives Matter. And for me, it was quite a bittersweet moment in the sense of this is work I've been doing for so long um, to help level out the inequalities in between people. But then I remember Boris Johnson made a speech and even from my own studying of capitalism that inequality is essential in the system in which we live, right? And we also know that equality of opportunity doesn't also mean equality of outcome. So I want to ask you as well, why is it equality is so attractive to people? Is it that emotional response for in, in us that we want to feel the people around us have the same opportunities as us? But then at the same time, as you said, we always want to dictate the outcomes in that very same breath, which is also impossible. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I'll answer that question, but I'll, 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 I'll put one back to you. Is it, that quali- is it that equality is attractive to people or is it that equality is attractive to people who are marginalised that don't have it? Because if you look at the, the elites, you don't see that same energy for equality from people who have the benefits of equality. So I, I, guess, I guess my answer to the question is equality is attractive to people because I think there's an ingrained need to be altruistic. Yes. Um, and it's also attractive to people who, who don't have because that's your cause. You, you've lived your life without. So that space is, it needs filling. And also that there are some people just because of their more reference codes and compasses, they don't believe in having unfair advantages. It, it doesn't feel right. There's just something great about earning things, you know? Don't get me wrong, we'd love to wake up a millionaire, but there is just <laughs> something so in, intrinsically valuable and, I don't know, self-fulfilling um, about earning something and and seeing through something as opposed to being gifted to you at someone's expense but I, I, again I'm, I'm i'm so big on not trying to romanticize equality because we, we need to be aware of of again like i said there are differences and and the world isn't run on an equal balanced keel we, we don't run like that i'd like us to be more equal I, i'd like us to run more efficiently and more fairly and to run more proportionately but you have to look at things because this is what I mean. Now. And you've got to pick your fights and your causes and accept your imperfections, right? Because you can sit here and say, right, you know, we need to be more equal in, in communities. People need more opportunities. As you said, equal rights isn't equal outputs because it manifests differently in different communities and different environments based on people's demographics and setups and the, the historical, I guess, the historical cultural capital. But what, what does it mean if you start paying everyone the same wage? What does that do to the economy? What does that do in, in terms of stifling people's creativity or incentive to want to make more yeah. and, and do more innovative new things? How do you balance the checks? I'm not saying you can't improve things, but this like you this like you, utopia of, of having a world where everyone's on hundred K a year minimum th- doesn't work unless the cost of living has to increase. It's just I don't know if I'm not saying capitalism is the best means to manage the economy but I'm not sure how successfully as alternatives would work. And that's also one of the greatest arguments I have within my head. So we have the NHS, which is a very socialist idea in many aspects because it Mm. believes in free healthcare for all. But then you go to America, they don't believe healthcare is a right. They believe it's an actual privilege. You should buy into your healthcare, which divides the wealth gap between the rich and the poor even more. And then also you you think about a lot of things. There was a great book called Utopia Utopia for Realists, and they were arguing about a universal base income. And then you also even had Finland, I think, if I'm correct off the top of my head, or Norway, I can't remember which country it was, they ended homelessness because money, financially speaking, it made more sense to end homelessness than to keep it alive, right? But we also know within the capitalist structures, um, inequality is essential for some people to be at the bottom and for some people to be at the top. And I feel within the minefield of identity politics, in many aspects, we've been fighting for rights and privileges as opposed to what is it that we really, really want? Do we want that equality of outcome within those equalities of opportunity? So you think about it, right? Black people make up 33% of the population in the UK. 
people don't understand it's big but it's not as big as you really think that is right people mm. really don't understand that but as a people we've punched above our weight in terms of the cultural capital we have in terms of um the financial capital you know you had the black pound day you know we got black businesses you the music we've made but even through all of that we still don't have the equality of outcome in which we would like and this is very specific to our community because we relate to that right how would mm. we then manifest that equality in reality because equality in theory sounds beautiful but how do we put that into into reality now and i know it's a quite a tough question but i want to get your view on it cool all right well first things first because i'm a stickler for facts we're not we're not that there isn't they percent of black people in the uk it's, it's london it's more like 40 but in the uk we're actually like three percent in, in yeah, the UK, three percent in the UK, thirty-three like percent in London. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think people people forget that, like the pro, the small proportion of we are. So, when everyone wants representation, it's it's where's the pool that is going to come from? Exactly. And, and, we, and we need to not forget we 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 are coming from a traditionally white country. That's fine. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that too. And and that's just just a fact. So you know you don't expect you know you wouldn't expect to go to somewhere that's predominantly black and see more white people. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. It's, it's okay, you know. Um, it's tricky, but you made a point earlier on. I think it's important to ask this because what do we actually want? Yeah. What is it we actually want? And and this is what I mean because companies are so used to virtue signaling. Yeah. With these little hashtags and <laughs> you know sticking LGBTQ colored rainbows on their well, on their on their remember Mark Spencer made the LGBT sandwich. Yeah, and I'm, I mean. <sighs> I know, I know they, that you know, means something to some people, but think about it. It's all it's called it's it's woke washing. These companies like to pretend that they sit on the side of social justice issues, but they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they know if they don't jump on the bandwagon, they're gonna lose money, man. That's all it is. Look at Nike, Raheem Sterling, Casta Semenya, Colin Kaepernick, all mm. these athletes, they jumped on the bandwagon because they knew it made money. Do you really think Nike actually cares? Nike exploit workers all the time. This is what I mean. There's a, there's a, there's a dichotomy in human. This is what I mean. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I very rarely attack people's views nowadays because I'm, I'm just understanding that there's just a massive dichotomy between who we think we are and who we actually are, and ah, and yes. how much we can do about the reality of 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 like life. And I can't make a generalization and say that Colin Kaepernick didn't support the cause because he cares. Because to me, it's like he does really care. I can't, I can't say 100 percent that that Nike do not support equality but of course there's a financial benefit to these things we, we we'd be foolish to to, to deny that we, we'd be foolish because everyone has their own interests and values and for me the biggest thing that anyone in the in a community like ours can do to empower themselves and to deal with what's going on in the society in terms of what we should ask for what we should want is yeah money is great but something that i think to go alongside the money and the, the rebuilding we need is cultural capital we don't have any cultural capital is my thing we don't have any. I mean, we have some, but we lack the cultural capital. We, I, and that's what I think is our biggest, our downfall. I strongly disagree with that. And the only reason <laughs> I say I disagree with that is because think about it, right? Rap where, you know, or music. Let me just say music in general. We have massive cultural capital. You know, you've got um, fashion. We have huge cultural capital. Maybe not in representation in terms of the models, but in terms of how much we consume. And I think cultural capital and social capital are one thing. But then ask the question, we have the financial capital. It's just how do we spend that money? How do we pour it into pools of black wealth and black excellence? We have to make sacrifices happen, right? So you think mm -hmm. about it. There's always these jokes that people make that why is it an Asian can't take a free kick because they try to buy the corner shop? When you think about it, when you're young, that's funny. But as you get right. older, you start to understand economics and finances, they have built wealth off doing that. They've been able to do that. There's areas within London or outside of London that are dominated by certain ethnic minorities because they've been able to sacrifice and invest in it. And a lot of other communities don't necessarily care for the cultural capital, but they care more for that financial capital because we know if money mm. makes the world go round. Cash rules everything around me, in the words of Grandmaster Flex. So why is it we need cultural capital above financial capital then? 
I don't think we need it above financial capital, but I think some of the cultural capital we have got is oh, it's, it's tainted because it's it's it, it's it's covered in a lot of pain and and, and it's it's born out of a lot of negative things and I, and I think we need to reinvent our cultural capital so I mean like a lot of our cultural capital that supports our social mobility and our, and our presence socially is got, is coming from pain that's what I mean about our cultural yeah. capital because in some communities in some communities they have a cultural capital too right but it's not built off pain so much it's, it's not built off of not having and, and we're building from a, a point of pain so when we do get into these places we just don't have the, the ability to take that mobilization financially we don't have the the means so if we if we were to get the right money we have to, for me it's about rebuilding the community like look at what the jews are doing i mean there's a lot of controversy in many different um ethnic groups but look at what the jews are doing in terms of how they're rebuilding the communities and how they're, they're buying back you know lots of land and areas so that they can they can just almost breed a community within a community that has a set of core values and traditions and that that way that way when they go out into into the world they they look like shields because their their values back back home said i'm saying that proverbi proverbially but back home that's what gives them their clarity and i think we're just a we're so great as black people right we're so amazing man we're so amazing but we're, we're almost so amazing that we're, we're a bit in everywhere that we're not united enough as one in, in one place that's, that's why i think it's our, it's our downfall but it's tricky do, do you think we need reparations uh, and if you say yes how do you how you just how do you disseminate that you know how i, I i've written many articles on it and i've <laughs> written essays on the argument of reparations so we know that in Germany, the German government gave back reparations to the Jewish community. And we also know in the UK that the Jewish community, when they were tired of anti-Semitism by the police and by government, they created their own Jewish police force called the Shamra, the Hebrew Guardians, otherwise known. Mm. And they looked after their own community. They don't necessarily... Um, I have a few friends who are Jewish, and obviously they are not ambassadors and representatives of the entire Jewish community. They have their own viewpoints, but they say there's one thing that they admire. It's the unity. However, in that same mm -hmm. breath, with that unity, they are very willing to push out people who do not represent that unity. So as a people, do we have to get back to that? That's a whole nother question. But mm. going back on to reparations, reparations in theory is fantastic. In theory, it is good. And I would agree with it. And I remember there was a famous psychologist who said the argument of reparations quite typically nowadays has been if you are not willing to accept the damage you have done to a community, you trap them into a stone wall case where they are not able to move any further from where they have been in terms of that trauma. So some mm -hmm. people would argue by the minute you repro you acknowledge what wrong you have done to the community, you have to reckon with the fact you've actually done something wrong and you've got to seek to make it right. But then there's um, people such as, I'm not sure if you've ever seen the debate between Ta-Nehisi Coates, the guy who wrote Between the World and Me, fantastic book, is a letter mm. to a 15-year-old child, um, and Coleman Hughes, who's an economist, okay. he writes, and they, they argued with each other. And Ta-Nehisi Coates made a, an incredibly emotive argument, which was absolutely fantastic. Then Coleman Hughes broke it down philosophically almost, that why would I want money from a government when I've had no consent in wanting that money? It was a really interesting debate. Oh, wow. I think all in all, reparations in theory sounds good, but in reality, it's different. And then what would that reparations look like? Is it money? Is it the investment into those structures? And then as a result of that money, what contract does that money come with? You've got to ask yourself because nobody gets free money, Jamal. You know this. Remember, man. <laughs> remember when we were in sixth form and we used to get EMA, and you know, yeah. and then what happened from thirty pound a, a week to twenty <laughs> to ten pound a week? If you didn't go to school, um, you didn't go to a certain amount of lessons, you didn't get your EMA. What contract does that money come with? You've got to exactly. ask yourself those questions. So, it's a really good question you've asked me. It's just reparations is a really hard one because you mm. and I, we are quite, I would humbly say, quite well-established people in our fields, right? And would reparations make a big difference to both our lives? I'm not really too sure. But then there are people who it would make really big decisions for. And then I know people on the right side who are conservative leaning, they don't believe in reparations at all. They don't fall in line with the orthodoxy of the liberal black thought that we currently have at the moment where 
everything is about reparations and equality and so much more. So it's just, it, it's a hard one. But I think my answer to that has to be in short, it's good in theory. In reality, it doesn't work because identity politics has divided the world more than it's brought us together. Completely. I, I, I completely hear that. I think as well, just to add to that, where it's just, for me, it, the thought of being bought, we're always being bought, you know, but there's always a catch for something. There's always, what, what, what is really three in this world, right? We're, we're constantly being traded. Yeah. You know, almost like intellectual property, you know? being traded like shares on the stock market you know <laughs> different values at different times that's literally a metaphor for what society is like it, it takes our emotions and our situations uses an algorithm works out our value at that given time and we, and we get traded on, on the stock market that's virtually how you know the algorithms that govern what we use does think about social media think about how you know think about the adverts you see and, and we see them think about the kind of um the kind of offers you see Black Friday offers. Think about the kind of things that are on TV. Think about everything. Like everything, everything that you tap into is almost like right. They've they've worked out what they think you need right now, and we're going to flood it. We're going to flood. We're going to flood you with all this information, and in the hope that something will stick, and you'll buy yeah. into it. And that's what it is. It's, it's a trade off. Um, something that I'm a I'm a strong believer of. More so as I've got older, is that man. There's just there's no greater feeling than being free and and in control and in control of every part of yourself, the bad parts too, you know, I'd love to be in control of making my own mistakes. I'd love to be in a place where we can just control what we do. Because as we said at the beginning of the conversation, I, I didn't want it to become a dark and negative analysis paralysis type conversation where we just have more questions than answers, which happens sometimes. But I wanted to, I wanted to leave this, this chat with you kind of empowering people, but also making people feel like they're not alone and, and that they're, they're, their opinions and their viewpoints are valid. Like they're, they're incredibly valid and their experiences are valid, albeit different, they're incredibly valid. Like whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling now, it's transitional, right? Because life is transitional, but understand that life is transient. Moments come and go that you, you can't dwell on, on them too much. And I think we should, you know, really seek to unlock the truth. You know, I'm telling you, man, there's, there's nothing more empowering than just telling the truth. I, I, I really mean that, you know, truth, it's a big thing. It, it, it's so simple. It's so hard to really do just to, to, to be authentic, to, to not think about what you're doing too much and just be who you naturally feel feel you are. You know, I've been reading a lot about things like that these days and it's, it's helped me deal with everything that we're discussing and how I, even in, even in my answers to you, I think my answers to your questions, amazing questions, my I add, by the way, um, my answers to your questions are different now than what they would be nine months ago. Not just because I know more now, but just because my approach to responding to things is different now, you know? I'm, I'm sure as you've gotten older and you read, and I find there's no safer place in the world than a book. A book can't disappoint mm -hmm. you. The book, you know, literally lays things out and it tells you for what it is. And it sounds like you've been reading an incredible amount of self-help slash philosophical books in many other aspects. And as you get older, in some many ways, you become aligned with the thought that the world is the way the world is and as you said the only thing we can change is ourselves so that sense of individual sovereignty we have control over our own lives and yes of course there's greater forces at play but we determine how we react to that so then you also spoke about truth what is true to jamal what mm. what what is your truth yeah. You listen, you're not playing with the questions today. I respect it. I respect it. Okay, coming <laughs> strong today. But I, I'll answer that question. But just go back to, to, to the self-help um, point, because that kind of alludes to this point as well. I don't really read much self-help help books. To be honest. I, had, I had a phase, but not really. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, potentially impact some of their, 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 um, their marketing by saying this. But <laughs> I was on a bus. I, I was in Wandsworth. I was on a bus in Wandsworth, on a 270 in Wandsworth, right? Yeah. Coming from work. And I got a bus home for some odd reason. I was trying to be more economical at this phase of my life. And I was on the bus and I'm reading, oh, it's a famous book. It's a famous book by Daniel Carnegie. Who, what is it again? It's something like- How to like, Win Friends? Or how to Win Friends and Influence Yeah, How to Influence Win Friends people. and Influence People. I had a feeling that in, was This is funny, right? So in my, in, in my world, in my professional corporate world, that's like the go-to book. That's like the godfather of books on yeah. just being great with people and clients and building relationships and stuff. So I was, you know, you know, I give it a look. So I'm reading the book now, right? Um, and I'm on the bottom deck of the bus at the back and I'm reading it. 
and I'm kind of like leaning on, on, on the wall. And we're going through Wandsworth and I just start falling asleep. And I keep waking up out of my sleep. And in my peripheral vision, there's a lady, maybe two seats from me, and she's just looking at me. Like, I keep catching her looking at me. So um, I look at her and I'm like, you know, you okay? And she goes, yeah, you? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I was a bit confused as to why she was watching me. Yeah. Um, and then she goes to me, how are you finding the book? And I went, yeah, early, early doors, but it seems interesting. And I went, why have you read it? And she laughed and she went, yeah, years ago. And I go, what's funny? And she goes, I don't know. I just, I just look at young people sometimes with their self-help books and think, why do you think the answers are in that book? Why don't you trust yourself? We're so used to looking for answers elsewhere that we're not trusting ourselves for the answers. Why, why do we, why do we like mandate and presume that this book is going to give us the clarity we need when the truth is, it's within you because all you're reading is, a, is another person's opinions. So why is that opinion more valid, valid than yours? And I can't lie, I did never come back to that. <laughs> and it, that stayed with me forever. I, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, there's value in self-help as a, you know, academically, as a piece of literature to collate more ideas. But yeah. fundamentally, I think you need to look in yourself and, 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 and experience the world to, 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 to govern your thoughts. So yeah, I, I don't really read stuff much, much these days. I'm more philosophy, I'm more, I'm more economics and psychology. Really. That's, that's my, my passion. So I, I stay with that, with, that, with that side of things. But to answer your question, which I've, I've been evading for a little while, what is my <laughs> truth? What does truth mean to me? Right. I describe myself as an onion, okay? Because it's, so it's going to sound weird. So what, you make people cry? Maybe, 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 right? But that's, listen, I'll let them decide that one. I'm, I'm a big believer of not marking your own work, so they can, they can tell me that. But I'm an onion because there's layers to me, right? You just have to peel them back. And it's like with like Tupac, if anyone who met Tupac said, I've seen in interviews, they say that you could ask 10 people what's Tupac like, and you'd get completely different answers. Yeah. You know, that doesn't make him any more disingenuous. That just makes him nuanced. And, and my truth is very nuanced. And my truth is adaptive. And I don't, I don't, I don't ever commit or wed myself to any idea, 100%. Now to some people, that's problematic. Because they say, Jamal, you're inconsistent. You can't make your mind up. You, you know, you tend to change your mind. And I'm, and I'm okay with that because I'm, my truth is actually finding truth, not finding things that fit my preconceptions. And I'm happy with that changing from day to day. And it, it can be unsettling for people, but for me, it's okay. Just, just personally, for me, my truth is, 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 is love, man. Like love is, at, is, at the, at the, is the epitome of my emotions. It's the epitome of my experiences. And I get that love from, honestly, bro, things like this. This is where I, where I, I get emotional solace. This is where I derive meaning and, and, and purpose from these kind of you know, conversations with an interlocutor like, like, like yourself. And I, and I really value these things. So my, my truth is, is existing in a way that allows you to never commit yourself to anything permanently so that you block yourself from new ideas. Okay. I think you're right. People always, I think once upon a time ago, people would say, I was super set in my views, right? And as I've gotten older, I started to read things that go against my preconceptions and my opinions. And you're right. I think solace is the absolutely, a it's the epitome of the word I want to use. I have found solace in reading opinions very different from mine because it makes me either really sit down and reckon with my own thoughts, but then at the same time realize that a six is a nine. It just depends on what view you're looking at it from. Right? I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. And then it also reminds you that no matter how thinly you cut the cake or the bread, there's always two sides. Mm hmm right it always makes you remember there's always two sides it's the bat the it's the battle of perspectives right and with me being able to no longer be certain about my opinion it's made me I i'm sure like yourself you'll probably agree with this it's made you more open to receive information that you mm. ordinarily would not have been able to receive due to your preconception and due to your judgments on things right mm. and then i'm sure people might have asked you, oh, Jamal, what's your star sign, man? It must be because of your star sign. You know, there's that astrological determinism in which people have. So <laughs> am I sending for people that believe in star signs? Take it how you want, as Jamal <laughs> says. You know, whatever That's idea it. you wed yourself to, make sure you marry that. But I divorce astrological determinism. Oh, that was you quick. <laughs> I get you, man. I, I get you. I mean, that's what I'm trying to, I mean, this, this is what I mean. Like, I don't, uh, listen, man. 
you'll be surprised how much things in life you can get over and get past, right? I'll, I'll say that, take that what you will. You'll be surprised how many things you thought you believed until that came to be untrue. And just for me, my, my truth, I, I derive that truth from experiencing life. I just want to be present. I don't, and this is what, I mean, I'm not particularly religious. Um, I'm not atheist either, but I'm not particularly religious. religious. I'm, I'm kind of agnostic, right? And, and this is not going to please everyone, but for me, I don't see the bad thing in there being nothing else. I don't, I don't see that as a tragedy. It, it, it isn't tragic to end. Why is that? Why is there just a heavy connotation between between tragedy and 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 and, and ending? Why can't there be something quite beautiful and and mystical in our limitations and, and and life? So I'm just more. My truth is all in optimization. I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here to optimize, Sean. I'm not here to inspire, I'm here to optimize. And, and if through my optimization are inspired, then that's two birds with one stone. And that's where I, I derive my meaning and my truth from, from existing and from finding purpose and touching lives wherever I can and whatever I can do it. Um, so, and I, I want to read something to you by Carla. And it, this, this to me has stayed with me from when I read his book a while back, um, Natives, and he speaks kind of about purpose and truth. And before I say it, the, 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 the crux of, of the argument is that what will the world look like to, in 20, 30 years time when the things that connected us ideologically have changed? When the landscape has changed, when we've changed, when us growing up as working class people aren't working class anymore, are we still gonna have that energy for inequality? Are we still gonna see the world in the same way? Are we still gonna be wedded to certain communities that, as, as we said we were? And what happens when we get so quote unquote woke and intellectual that we find that there's no answers? Do we just get fed up with life and, I, and I'll read it to you now because I'm, I'm waffling right so it goes like this um where is it right how will black westerners react to the changing worlds will we maintain emotional links with the interests of the global south generation or two will we fall into a trap of the black bourgeoisie will relative comfort and privilege change us for the worse when all the caribbean and indian born postal generation are dead as will soon be the case and we are just british people how will this affect our political consciousness? I often look at the world and I think, fuck it, why bother? But I know that's how we're supposed to feel. And that's why corruption is so naked and freely visible to wear down the people of the conviction that things could be better. And that to me just blew my mind. Like it blew my mind to the point where I'm gonna memorize it, right? Because what that says to me is, how much of you is who you think you are today and, and how will you change as your circumstances change and your perspective change and, and how will you be able to combat and battle the intrinsic things and survival things that are built within you? How do, how do you live in a world where everything is telling you to give up? And that's kind of the metaphor for I think, today's conversation that this is not about tough conversations, it's about solutions. Through millennia, there's always been transition and growth and, 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 and death and mourning and, and happiness and discovery. How will you survive when the world is constantly telling you to give up? And that's my sole focus. That, in many aspects, that could fly over somebody's head, but you're right. The world is Bro. changing in ways, as you originally said from the very beginning, we cannot comprehend. And I read um, Yuval Noah Harari's book and some people yeah, argue yeah. that he's somebody who he got high and wrote a book, but I think he breaks down the world in a very interesting way. And I read 21st Century Problems and he was saying that the world, the way we see the world now, we cannot comprehend what the future will look like and how it will play out on humanity, right? And what Akala said is true because I've read Natives and I thought it was an absolutely fantastic but a quite humbling and sobering read. Very sobering. The, the Black existence and of Black society. And then there was also the argument in some technological books that we can eradicate things such as prejudice, racism and misconceptions by rewiring and recircuiting the brain. And then what would that look like for society? And then how would that also play out? So it's incredibly pertinent what you've said and it's really made me think as well that we still aren't ready for change no matter how much we read the more i read and i'm sure you feel this too is the more i realize i know nothing at all absolutely you know absolutely it's what is it the day the, the day you stop learning is the day you stop living i think that's a quote mm. by someone and i feel this conversation 
has really epitomized we actually know nothing but we know something very little but at the same time we're also incredibly happy with understanding there's stuff we will never know and i this is one of my biggest arguments with a lot of religion people always ask me all the time sean especially christians like what do you believe in after death and i say i generally don't know because i've never been there i know death is um one of those things that will happen eventually but i don't know they said oh but god will take care of you and i say okay sure that's fine they said so why don't you believe in god i said i believe in something i'm just not sure what it is and i'm okay with that and it's as if in their head they can't comprehend i'm okay with that simply because i'm not going to pretend to know what i don't know and neither will i as you i'm going to use your words now neither am i going to wed myself to the idea that I do know either and to the simplistic idea that God will take care of me or if I've been good or if I've been bad you know I'm going to go to heaven or hell I simply don't know but I'm okay with that I think the same way you're okay with just there's some things we just don't know so why pretend we know but this but this is it Sean and, and this is I don't know what, again in the in the in the in the in the attempt to keep up this theme of being you know transparent and open maybe myself a year ago would have responded differently to people that felt like that and I, and also the, the, you know what, do you know what do you know what i think is crazy and, and like, like amazing if if you can have an opinion that you know is so widely hard to comprehend but still understand people's inability to understand you it's a yeah. beautiful thing because because now it's like when i say what you say and people look at, look at us and go what why are you okay with they just cannot fathom it and yeah your your first response is to almost attack and defend but that's not that isn't the approach anymore it's like actually you know what i i know why you can't get this do you know why because without without becoming you i've been able to experience in your shoes and and understand that from your perspective it doesn't correspond to your idea of life it just doesn't so some people cannot grasp that and again that that too is okay and when you can understand that different people respond differently to different stimulus yes then you're then you can become a bit more accepting of our uniqueness you know, and that's why I'm like, okay, you know, um, I, I get you. I've got some very religious people close to me, and I have the utmost respect for them and, and their beliefs, because I have to understand, even though I cannot live their experiences, yeah, that this is something that, in their mind, is black and white, and, and it's very their truth, simple, right? It's their truth, and they're entitled to that, which is the key. Absolutely, absolutely, Jamal, man, what a philosophically driven but incredibly intellectually arousing, <laughs> stimulating conversation. I, I you know, mm. it's so good that we've been able to grow up. And as you said, we've lived very different lives in the world that we've lived, you know. Ordinarily, a couple of years ago, I always used to regard myself as the floaty poo in school because I could float around mm. everywhere, you know. I could get away with being um, fast enough to chill with the cool guys like yourself but then at the same time <laughs> I was nerdy enough to chill with the guys who were only in the library and then because I liked Yu-Gi-Oh I could chill with the other kids so it just shows how in many aspects that whilst we've grown differently we've been able to find parallels within our very different experiences mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and and as you said let me, I'm not a cool guy just to correct you I'm definitely Listen, more cost, you were part of the nerd. cool guys Jamal used to have yeah. clean rows back in the day <laughs> I used to regard, um, you know, Jamal as oh my Marian, at some sort. <laughs> Mate, you are flattering me ridiculously, but I'm a nomad, man. Like, and and, and I've like you, I, I float, and I'm, I'm happy with being nomad. I'm I'm happy with being politically homeless. I'm I'm happy with that, and it, yeah. it works for me. And and I again, I for me, I, I revel in in my ability to to, to to maneuver and pivot to different environments, like yourself. And Absolutely. there's always what's wrong, right? Like, I know we've had this conversation at quite, quite like a you know granular level, and it's been quite philosophical, and something that's gone over people's heads. It's been quite deep and intense. But back to the onion analogy, this is what happened to be the topic of today. I mean, you could talk, and we have talked. We've we've spoken on different occasions about completely different things, and and the the. Rest, the, the, the conversation is different. Maybe we can sit here and chat about social media. We can chat about artificial intelligence, about blockchain, about money, about females, about sports. We can do all of that. And it's just dependent on whatever the criteria is today, we, we can do. So, so you know, I, I would say that, you know, best believe that there's versatility in our ability to have different conversations, depending on who we're talking to and, and what about. And you're right, being politically homeless, 
like I find myself to be quite moderate. I agree with the left and the right on very different issues. And when you're not thrown into binaries and you're not thrown into boxes, as you said, you can see things outside of your perspective. And because we've been able to have that freedom and ride the waves of where the conversation has brought us today, it shows that whilst our ship may not be, you know, moored shallowly, it also has the depth to withstand the storm or the tsunamis or whatever comes within that waters. I would love to know then, for those that are going to walk away from this conversation, we spoke very at the beginning about solutions. What solution do you have for those out there who perhaps are struggling with the reality of life, perhaps haven't found their truth or their purpose? What advice would you give them? Mm, great question. Trust yourself. Yeah. Honestly, it sounds simple, but, but, but trust yourself. I'm, I'm a massive believer that we should be free to express who we are the moment you become comfortable with everything that makes you you is the moment that you believe you've got the tools to deal with whatever the problem is because and speak about yourself positively you know regard yourself highly because no one ever questions the growth of, of a flower literally no one ever questions the flower's growth <laughs> so you know almost perceive yourself as that flower you, you are on a journey metaphorically developing and there will be thorns there'll be rain there'll be wind you may not grow it immediately. The soil around you may, you know, ferment, <laughs> but you must continue to grow and, and you must continue to absorb everything around you and trust yourself to develop because I promise you, you have everything you need internally. You are, you, you are wonderfully and perfectly equipped to deal with everything before you. You just don't know it yet. Do you hear that? You are wonderfully, purposefully built to know and to deal with everything that you have around you and you are equipped. Jamar has been a breath of fresh air in this polluted air of politics, you know, philosophy and life. So Jamal, I am so thankful you've been able to come on and just have a conversation. Thank you, man. Honestly, it's been an honor. This, this guy is, Sean, you're doing great things, man. This is a great, great way to get people to interact and engage and please continue the discourse because I've, I've probably enjoyed it and hopefully we can do it again sometime. No, most definitely. So, I'm just looking forward to what the future holds for us both. It's big things only, Sean. You know that already. So we'll see where it takes us. Most definitely. Jamal, we'll talk soon. Definitely. Thanks. All man. right, King.